So with that being said, turn with me to the 12th chapter in the book of John for a very familiar lesson that we all know. Very familiar lesson that we all know. Amen. And for those of you who can stand, beloved, please stand for the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. Y'all, I was about to go a little, John 12 chapter. I was about to go a little bit farther because I see my little cousin, Brittany, here. And we got to get ready to start a, a young people's ministry, Brittany. So don't run after service, okay? I know you're going to run away. But Tiffany, we need to have a young people's ministry here. Amen. Listen, y'all, when I grew up in church, all we had was the usher board and the choir. That's it. But when you get older, you be like, hey, I need something else. Yeah, yeah. And we got to make sure we offer these young people something else. Yeah, yeah. Amen, somebody. Yeah. John, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse number 12. And, beloved, I'm reading out of what's known as an NASV. It's the New American Standard Bible version. This is the year of 1995's edition. Amen. So it may read just a little different from what you're reading in your word. But it's, it is the word. Amen. And beloved, verse number 12 says this, on the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast when they had heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him. And guess what? And began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey set on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. These things his disciples did not understand at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and, they had, and that they had done these things to him. So the people who were with him when he had called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify about him. Oh, my God. For this reason, also the people went and met him, because they had heard he had performed this sign. Watch this, church. So the Pharisees said one to another, You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone out. You talking about some jealousy and some hate. <laughs> I want to talk to you from this subject. Jesus, the King of Kings. The King of Kings. There'll be a lot of reading today, a lot of teaching today. So you'll have to pay a lot of attention today. In this 12th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus is once more about to reveal his identity to the nation of Israel. They will be given one final opportunity to receive their king. This chapter, which records the details of the last few days of Christ's public ministry, paints a portrait of Jesus as the king of kings. In order to understand, beloved, the events and the significance of the triumphal entry, you must understand the events that transpired in chapter number 11. For it was in chapter 11, uh, beloved, that Jesus received the call from, from those who had been with his closest friend Lazarus. And more importantly, uh, Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, had gotten word uh, to Jesus that their brother Lazarus has died. And, and, and beloved, in, in, their, in, in their minds, they were thinking that because Lazarus has died, that, that if we get word to Jesus, then Jesus can once again show his resurrection power and come and raise our dear brother from the dead. Now, beloved, Jesus wasn't that far away. Jesus was very close to where they were residing, but Jesus told his disciples, in order for you to truly understand, I'm going to say it in my own words, I'm going to take my time and get there, only so you'll believe. 
Beloved, uh, in, in those days, they believed that after three days that the soul would leave the body and there would be nothing left but the body of this individual who had died. So Jesus, being Jesus, purposely waited till the fourth day to show up at the tomb of Lazarus. And one of his sisters said, surely uh, Jesus Lazarus has now been dead for four days. Surely he's going to smell. Jesus said, what you don't understand is that I am the resurrection. And, and, and yo, he may be dead, those who believeth on me uh, shall have what everlasting life. Beloved, I'm just telling the story in my own way. Jesus went to where Lazarus was, and he simply said, Lazarus, get up. And all of a sudden, Lazarus walked out of the tomb with his grave clothes on, with his feet bonded and his with face cloth. And beloved, the reason why Jesus said, Lazarus, uh, get up, because if he would have simply said, get up, then there would have been folk climbing out of the graves, folks getting out of the tombs. We would have seen folk coming from everywhere who had died in the Lord. So Jesus had to be specific because guess what? He is the king of kings. Now y'all help me uh, this morning. Now, oh, if he would have just said, get up. Folk from everywhere, tombs would have been reeling and rocking and folk would have been walking up. Did you call me? Yeah, yeah, but isn't it just like Jesus to be intentional and specific in his conversation? Watch this, watch this. Uh, when we go to John and 11, 47, go there uh, with me, beloved. John 11, 40, uh, 47 and 48 will paint the picture on why Jesus was such a hated individual. John 11, 47 and 48. Y'all, my technology is not working the way technology should, but that's all right. God is still in control. John 11, 47 and 48 says this. Therefore, and this was after Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Listen. Let me read this last verse. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and the whole nation not perish. Caiaphas understood that he knew that Jesus had a different type of power than other men had possessed. And, and he said, wouldn't it not be better for one man to die than for the entire nation to perish because of the seething and the upheaval of all that's going on? Watch this. The, the Pharisees, they hated him so much that uh, uh, they look back on the miracles, uh, beloved, that Jesus had performed. Now, they were disheartened by what he did before, but it really was the miracle where he raised Lazarus. Because if you think about it, in John 2, 1 and 11, he changed water into wine. That was Christ's first miracle. Then in John 4, he healed the royal official sons over in Capernaum. But that didn't make them that mad. Then he was healing uh, the paralytic person over at Bethesda in John 1 through 15. Uh, but that wasn't all that bad to them. Uh, uh, then in John 6, he uh, got caught feeding 5,000 uh, people over in there, including children. Uh, but that didn't get on their nerves. And, and then if they kept reading in John 6, uh, they saw Jesus walking on water. Now, they was upset, but they wasn't that upset. Uh, and then in John 9, they seen that he was healing a blind man from birth. Now, we don't like that, but we going to deal with it. Uh, but that was it. That was it. That was it. See, see, there's one thing 
when someone does something that gets on your nerve, but then there's another thing when somebody do something gets under your skin. Oh, y'all talk back to me, church. You, you talk back to me. See, 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 the things that he did prior to this had got on their nerve. But him raising Lazarus from the dead on the fourth day let them know that they didn't have the power over Jesus that they thought they had. Let, let me come on your street. Let me come on. Yo, street, your neighbors uh, get upset because you got a new uh, Toyota, uh, uh, whatever, Tundra. They upset because they want a new car, but that one really wasn't made them upset. What was upsetting to them was when you pulled up in that uh, Porsche uh, that they've been trying to get uh, for so long and they couldn't get it themselves. Uh, see, that, that they got mad when they watched your child graduate from a school that their child failed out of. That's when they got, oh, they got mad when you got the promotion and you uh, got the recognition that they didn't get. Folk, let me tell you this. Some folk will get mad about certain things but then they'll hate you for certain other things. Maybe I need to slow down and say it. Maybe I need to slow down. There are some folk who deal with you because your blessings haven't interrupted their lives. But as soon as your blessing interferes with their course of what they feel life should be, now it becomes an issue. See, a lot of us are fine as long as we don't see your blessing. Y'all will get it. Y'all will get it. Listen, Jesus, he proved his identity time and again by his miracles, by his pedigree, by his place of birth, by signs and wonders too numerous to mention, yet they refused to believe that he was in fact the Messiah. Time and time again, he revealed himself unto them, and time and time again, they rejected him. Family, think over your life time after time after time. Jesus has revealed himself to you, and you still reject him. How, how, let me say it so, uh, so I can get some of the tired folk to wake up. When you look back over your life, and you think of those situations that you got yourself in, when you should have gone crazy, you should have lost your mind, you should have lost your job, you should have lost hope. You should have lost your ability. But, but for some strange reason, for some strange reason, things just started to turn around and move for the better. Don't, don't you sit here and take credit uh, for things turning around in your life. Uh, family, you need to know that Jesus steps in at the right time and he picks you up and he turns you around and he places your feet on a solid ground where you was once on an unstable foundation. He placed you in a place of stability. You better say thank God for Jesus. Because he is... Uh, the king of kings. Tell your neighbor, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes. Let me tell you this, beloved. Watch this. So much that John puts it this way. He came into his own, and his own received him not. That is, Jesus came into his own intimates, as in his family and friends, yet they refused him. Beloved, can I just pause for the cause here? Isn't it amazing how strangers, people who don't really know you, who are not connected to you, will be happier for increasing your life than those who walk with you daily? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I, I, got, I got strangers on the job that say, Dwayne, you did an awesome thing, good work, great job on your promotion, man. You doing your thing. But the same ones who I sit in the cafeteria with ain't saying nothing. 
They ain't said nothing. They ain't said nothing. You know why? Because all they remember is the stories y'all talked about, the pictures y'all shared, and the fact that you all are living in the same situation. But now all of a sudden that God has sent increase in your life and not increase in their life, you will be amongst your own and your own will not receive you. Can I go a little bit deeper? Typically, it's the ones who share your last name. Because in their mind, I know you. They don't know you like I know you. They don't know you like I know you. Oh, I remember when you used to be this. And, and I remember when you used to be that. And I told them, but here's what you don't know. I bet you don't know how many hairs on my head. <laughs> Because Jesus said, I know you, I know you, and you know how I know you? Because I know the very number of hairs you got on your head. You may know of me, but he knows me for who I am. You know why? Because he is the king of kings. Y'all talk back to me. Jesus clearly proved uh, his identity by fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy. When the Romans saw Jesus riding a donkey, uh, they probably thought it was all a joke. After all, what king rides on a donkey? They did not see him as a threat to the Roman power, and many of the Jews probably wondered why this one would be the king riding in on a lowly donkey. After all, wouldn't the Messiah be riding a powerful workhorse? Even Christ's own disciples did not understand the importance of what they were witnessing. However, anyone in the crowd who knew the prophecy of Zechariah, they began to rejoice greatly. O oh, daughter of Zion, shout! O oh, daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just uh, and having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a coat of the fowl of an ass. In Zechariah 9 and 9, those who understood the prophetic words of Zechariah was like, here he comes. Oh, it's something different when you see power in people that others don't see. Oftentimes, we miss our blessing because it's not coming in the way or the form in which we think it should come. You upset because on Christmas, you had the smallest gift in the smallest box while others had big boxes full of big gifts. Beloved, how many of you know that you can get a pair of five carat diamonds in a little bitty box just like this. And your little bitty box had more value than what they had in their big boxes. Uh, see, sometimes we trying to size people up for how they look. Uh, just because they're not six foot two, 225 pounds, uh, they might be about 300 and no six packs, but they got good benefits. Don't you miss your blessing because you're looking for something to come this way and it's looking like this. Tell your neighbor, don't miss your blessing. I got one pack. I got one pack. That's all I got. But guess what? I'm still a blessing, baby. Watch this. Watch this. Jesus, that was for y'all back there with your jokes. Oh, because they back there clowning me. They back there clowning me. But God, ain't, God don't like ugly. And he ain't too fond of kill. Jesus, watch this. That's why y'all need to go to another church, all three of y'all. Jesus, not you. Not you, First Lady Phaedra. It's the two heathens that's in between. So I want you to think like this. Y'all remember the story of the thief on the cross? And they said that Jesus stood in the midst of the thieves that was on the cross. He said there was one round on either side of him. So Sister Phaedra, you Jesus in the middle. Them two heathens, they still going to hell. Wait a minute, wait a minute. One of them did say, one of them did say, Lord, when you cometh into thine kingdom, please remember me. 
You going to heaven, baby. You going to heaven. <laughs> Tasha, still going to hell, dog. <laughs> That's for you, Jason. Watch this. Thank you. Jesus, and y'all, y'all give me, give me three minutes. Jesus made his ride. Made his ride into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. Just a few days before his death and exactly one week before his resurrection, his entrance into Jerusalem was on this particular day. This was no coincidence. This was no coincidence. According to Zechariah's prophecy, he came the day and the time he was supposed to be there. Watch this. When you go to the prophetic word of Daniel, and family, I need you. Tierra, if you're my Bible scholar, I need you to write this down and share this on Facebook. Daniel, the ninth chapter, start at verse number 24. It's going to be a lot of reading, but I need you to understand what the prophetic word meant. Watch this. A period, Deacon Hamilton, of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 25, now listen and understand. This is where it gets tough. Seven sets of seven Plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Did y'all get that? Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. What he is doing is he's giving a timeline. Of how uh, New Jerusalem, not New Jerusalem, but how Jerusalem will be built. Watch this. After this period of 62 sets of seven, and the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing as Jesus dies on the cross, right? And the ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with the flood. And war in its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. He's spelling out the destruction. Watch this in verse 27. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and the offerings. Why? Because there was no needs for no bullocks, no need for no rams, no need for this. Why? Because at this point, Jesus was being prepared to become the propitiation of our sins. He was being prepared to step from earth, from heaven to earth is when he said, give me a body so that I can go and be a sacrifice. But he understood his one role was to come to die. He will put an end to the sacrifices, and as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. In these verses, God's plan for the nation of Israel is on display. God will finish his work with Israel during a 70-week period. Somebody say 70 weeks. Somebody say, teacher, take us to class. Well, let's go. Watch this. And you have to read the book of Daniel to understand this because this is all prophetic word. Watch this. These are the weeks of years and not days. This is where a lot of people confuse it because they think that this timeline is talking about days, but it's actually talking about weeks of years. Okay. All right. This is a 490-year period, and it's a general chronologically will happen this way. They will begin with the order to rebuild Jerusalem. That's the rule number one. That's the first thing got to happen, right? And we see that in, in, um, we, we see that 
being filled in Nehemiah 2, 1 through 6, and this should happen or should have, would have happened around March 14th, 445 B.C. The next phase covers 69 uh, years or 69 weeks of years broken down into two portions. So now we see 69 weeks of years because we've lost one. It's taken us from 70 down to 69. Are y'all with me? The next phase covers 69 weeks of years broken down into two parts. The first part is it took seven weeks of years or 49 years to rebuild Jerusalem. So it took a whole lot of time, beloved, for, re for Jerusalem to be rebuilt. All of this time during the times of great trouble. And if you read the book of Nehemiah, you will see the great trouble that Jerusalem had went through in order to be rebuilt. From that time, there were 62 weeks of years or 434 years until the Messiah was to come. It taken, if taken literally, these 83 years leading up to the coming of the Messiah would equal this. Watch this number. 173,880 days. And watch when it ended. It ended on April 6, 32 AD, or the exact day Jesus entered into Jerusalem on his donkey. It was also on this day that he was officially rejected by the nation of Israel sealing their faith. So after these 70 weeks of years, after these uh, powerful things were going on, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, now the whole Old Testament is shut down. This seals the fate of the nation. This closes the book of the Old Testament. The Old Testament stops with this prophetic piece of history. Now, God, now, guess what happens? Now, beloved, since the book of the Old Testament is closed, God is not prepared yet for the New Testament to come in. So when you think about it, uh, Malachi closed the old book, but Matthew opened up the new book. But the problem was there was 400 years of silence that happened between Malachi and Matthew. So guess what? Nobody got saved. Nobody got delivered. Nobody got caught up. Nobody got set free. The choir robes got mildew. The Bibles got dusty. But Jesus said, give me some time. And at the appointed time, I'm going to come and I'm going to redeem man. But there needed to be 400 years of silence between the old and the new to get ready for what was to come. Oh, that sounds stuff. Y'all make me sick. That sounds stuff right there. 400, you mean, you mean in 400 years? Nobody got delivered. Nobody got set free. Nobody had an opportunity for the gospel in 400 years. Y'all talk about when it get dry in the street. That's for my unsaved folk. Y'all know what it is when it get dry in the street. I'm going to sip my tea on that one. Man, I can't get nothing out here. They ain't got nothing but Reggie out here. Ain't no loud out here right now. No prayers went up. Oh, I got you. <laughs> Somebody like that. <laughs> no prayers went up. No blessings came down. After the Messiah comes, there are several prophetic events that will take place. I'm going to say this and I'm going to go to my seat. The Messiah will be cut off. He'll be crucified. This is why the Jews refuse him and still do to this day. When you read 1 Corinthians 1 and 23, it says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks or unto the regular people. It's foolishness. This is why when you start to preach the gospel to people who don't believe, they look at you as if though you're a fool. There's people when we start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ will get up out of the sanctuary and walk outside because I don't want to hear this mess. Uh, at funerals, there's people who get up and leave their seats because they might mess around and hear something that's going to change their lives. Y'all talk back to me. 
Jerusalem will again be destroyed. That's why I said it wasn't the new Jerusalem. It was the new Jerusalem of the old day. Watch this. Uh, there will be a great war that will be engulfing in Israel. Russia and her allies will invade Israel. Oh, if I had time, if I had time to teach you about Russia invading Israel, if I had time to teach you about why Russia is invading Ukraine, don't think that what's going on right now today isn't prophetic. You better do your homework, class, and you better read it for yourselves and you'll have a better understanding of why Putin wants to take what Zelensky has. You better read for yourselves. 69 weeks or 483 years of the prophecy have been literally fulfilled. There is one week or seven years remaining. Jesus presented himself as the king of the Jews on the exact day when the prophet said he would. Simply stated, Jesus came as the king. He did exactly what God had said that he would do. And he did it to the letter. Oh, my God. They didn't understand why who they perceived to be king would be riding in on a lowly ass. You mean this is supposed to be our king? He's not going to help us conquer the Romans. He's riding in on a coat. He doesn't even have a war horse. But Jesus at all this time is just sitting there saying, It's me. It is me. I am the King of Kings. Well, how do we know? Because as is it written, according to the word of Moses, he said, before I am. Oh, my God. it's been over 2,000 years the death of Jesus does not have the same impact to us that it did 2,000 years ago be, be, because it's not fresh for us we don't deem the event as being something that changes your life it's just like when a loved one dies and months and weeks and days after the death of your loved one you're in mourning because you're, you're thinking uh, beloved about the memories you've shared you're thinking about the time you had together you're thinking about all that you lost you're thinking that when they went into the grave a chapter was closed in my life and so it hurts the closer you are to the death dates. But the world teaches us that, that, that weeping may endure for a night. But joy cometh in the morning. And, and, and so we go from M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G to M-O-R-N-I-N-G. We go from morning to morning hoping that we'll get some joy. That's what the world teaches us. That's what we're supposed to teach because we're supposed to teach to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And who wouldn't serve a God that can make you absent and present at the very same time? We're taught that. And so the ideologies of scripture that we have been taught to help us with our mankind woes may be the same scriptures that's separating us from the passion of the Christ. 
You'll catch that later. Because we're not mourning Christ's death, it doesn't affect us the same way. Because there's been 2,000 plus mornings. And so we are no longer mourners. Joe's in mourning because his father just passed. So every day he wakes up, he starts off by thinking about his father. He starts his day off by thinking about things him and his father did. You know why? Because right now he's a mourner in mourning. But people will keep telling him, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. So one morning he'll stop crying. See, 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 see what happens? We're taught to stop mourning because mourning's coming. And in our own intellectual mind, because we were not there when Jesus died, we were never mourners. So we've been just believing that mourning has come. So his death doesn't affect us the same way. Father, oh my God, we thank you. We thank you for dying of death and paying a debt that we could not pay for ourselves. We thank you for your redemptive work on Calvary. For the Bible declares that we were all sinners in need of a Savior. If he had not gone to the cross, the Bible says that we'd be all men most miserable. He did it for me. He did it for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, oh God. We thank you for that triumphal entry into the city of old Jerusalem. Father, we thank you for getting ready to prepare yourself for Passion Week, God. As they get ready to lead you down Golgotha's path. Beloved, as they get ready to lead our Savior to the cross. It'll be on Friday when we all are gathered together. And we'll remember the seven utterances from the cross. That will lead us on to resurrection Sunday morning. We won't leave you on the cross because you're not there then. But Lord God, we're walking the path with you now. And my prayer for every Christian all over the world is that this week as you walk down the road, that you'll remember the steps that Christ has taken in your life. And then you'll remember the steps that he's taken as he's been gone from judgment hall to judgment hall on his way to a hill called Golgotha. As he travels the Villa de la Rosa, we have a promise that we will walk with him every step of the way as we prepare for Friday. Lord God, we love you, we praise you, and we honor you, oh God. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your prophetic mission to save a dying, sin-sick world. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God.
Come on, let's give God a hand clap for praise. Oh, come on, family. We can do better than that.